All right, so now we're going to get started on drugs that affect calcium levels and bone mineralization, such as osteoporosis. Let me get the slideshow started. All right, so calcium physiology. Now, calcium physiology, um, uh, as well as with other electrolytes, calcium is very important. And one thing to know, calcium is also regulated in the parathyroid uh, which is right on both sides of the um, thyroid. So you have your thyroid here, and the parathyroid is like a butterfly. You have like four lobes of it. One, two, three, four. All right, so, and calcium is very critical to multiple functions in your body, including your whole nervous system, your skeletal, which should, you know, your bone formation, muscular, as well as your heart, too. So if anything's off with your calcium, you can have multiple symptoms um, that can be very dangerous and but the one thing is we're talking about bones now this time with calcium so your body stores 98 percent of calcium in the bones so while the parathyroid regulates it it's stored in the bones 98 percent which that's a lot um, so you have to when you think of a bone think of a dense bone but if it lacks calcium which helps with bone formation then you have a bone that looks like Swiss cheese, so it becomes brittle, and it's easily, you have a high risk for fracture of it breaking. So calcium is absorbed in the small intestine. It's increased by the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. Glucocorticoids, also, and glucocorticoids decrease the absorption of calcium. So while we talked about with glucocorticoids, with the sodium and water retention and the hypokalemia, it also can decrease absorption of calcium. Um, so we're going to talk about hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through this whole thing, um, but it's just to help you to understand that the parathyroid gland, I'm looking on my big screen because it's bigger on the screen. Um, your parathyroid gland is basically your brain talking to the your parathyroid, to the parathyroid, it's... Um, regulating the calcium. It's saying, hey, do I need calcium? Do I not need calcium? Vitamin D is involved in that. Um, para parathyroid hormones then um, excretes or secretes the calcium into the bone, which helps form the bone. Um, it's also absorbed in the small intestine. So you can see there's kind of like this cycle that looks kind of complicated, and you have all of these different types of enzymes, SLC34A1, et cetera. You don't need to know those, but just understand that 98% of your calcium um, is stored in the bone, and your parathyroid gland really helps regulate that, and it's absorbed in the small intestine. All right, so what is hypercalcemia? Um, too much calcium, right? So here's a little picture here. Um, now, when you look at blood, now when it says greater than 11, serum calcium levels greater than 11. So we really don't mess around with calcium. So if normal is, say, 8 to 11, if it's above 11, even 11.4, we want to make sure that they don't have you, that there's not anything going on with your parathyroid um, or there's no cancer going on or anything. So you really just got to start investigating that a little bit. Because um, sometimes too much can mean they have some bone metastasis. Because think, remember, it's stored in the bone. So if there's too much built up, is it going out into your blood? And too much is spilling into your bloodstream. Why is your bones um, having too much calcium? The regulation's not working, dysregulating, put it that way. Um, calcium resorption from the breast, the lung, or multiple myeloma, which is a type of cancer. It can also um, cause a loss of excitability in cell membranes, uh, fatigue, weakness, lethargy, anorexia, nausea, constipation, kidney stones from increased calcium salt. So remember I had said on this last that it's critical to the function of your skeletal, nervous, muscular, cardiovascular systems. So if you're having too much floating around in your bloodstream, it can um, cause excitability in cell membranes in your other organs of your body and cause these issues. Um, also, it can, um, since I mentioned that it has to do with cardiovascular uh, function, it can also um, cause some issues with um, uh, cardiac rhythm, which can cause some heart blocks, which is not, not good at all. 
So what are some drugs that can cause hypercalcemia? So many times, actually the first thing you should do when someone comes in with most issues that show up on labs or symptoms is you look at their drug list. Because remember, all drugs come with side effects. So while they have some benefit, there are side effects to them. And what people get, we just don't know. Everybody's different with side effects. So furosemide, steroids, uh, and then there's some other ones, which we will talk about in just a minute, the calcitonin bisphosphonates. Uh, we'll talk about rarely do I, I don't think I've ever seen a gallium nitrate, but bisphosphonates we'll talk about for osteoporosis. All right, so we talk about hypercalcemia. Now let's think of hypo. You think hyper, you'd be more excitable, but really when you lose the calcium, it increases that neuromuscular excitability. Um, because you don't have enough calcium to regulate your uh, muscles and so now you're going to get this excitability going which um, can cause all these symptoms it looks like this picture is a little bit or actually is blurry so you can get irritable you can have some spasms um, <clears throat> facial muscle spasms so tetanus is um, one thing so prevention you have to get childhood immunizations or get your tetanus shot up to date every eight to ten years Fever, restlessness, chills, exaggerated reflexes, jaw stiffness. So that's why they call it locked jaw, because years ago that's just what it was named, because they would get that, that um, spasming so bad that they could not even open up their mouth. So how are we going to treat this? So as you can see in the picture, she's bringing this person some food, so we look at dietary. How can we increase that? Remember the vitamin D? They need vitamin D for calcium to be absorbed to its um, greatest potential. Uh, so you see some milk there, some cheese, so foods high in calcium. <clears throat> you want to watch for signs of the tetanus right here. Um, if they have low calcium, so you need to look for that irritability, the heart, cardiac being probably the most important uh, there. Um, watch for bleeding of gums. Uh, watch the, for the dysrhythmias and and she says, also, I'll be careful about setting this IV infusion and we'll check the IV site because calcium is very irritating to the vein. There's two signs that you can actually do that's pretty simple and uh, very reliable to check for low, low calcium levels. And one would be the Chovic sign and then the Trousseau sign. So they, you have a facial nerve, which is... Um, um, uh, trigeminal nerve, let's see, the trigeminal nerve is CN5, so 2, 3, and 6 are the eyes, uh, so this is like 7 or 8 facial nerve. So a light tap over the facial nerve right in front of the ear, you just do this, it can cause facial muscle contractions, and then the other is the trousseau sign, and what you do is you take a blood pressure cuff, pump it up, and they'll automatically, oops, in the camera, their hand will do this. Um, it's like an automatic, um, it's a spasm of that carpal um, area. <clears throat> All right, so um, other disorders involving cal calcium, so rickets. And rickets we usually see in underdeveloped countries, people that have the lack of dietary calcium. Osteomalacia, which is another bone disease, Paget's disease is disease of the bone where the bones don't recycle, so you, we all have different we all have activities that go on in the bone to recycle it to new bone and which with Paget's disease it doesn't there's a malfunction there so they end up getting brittle bones and um, at high risk for fracture also hy hypoparathyroidism which we talk which would make sense because remember the parathyroid it's um, calcium is regulated hypo and hyper so primary and secondary. Primary just means that there's something wrong with the thyroid. Secondary means there's another cause. So you fix the cause, which would then fix the um, parathyroid issue. So you could have a tumor, um, and then you remove the tumor, and then the thyroid parathyroid will go back to normal. Not a tumor in the thyroid, but somewhere else. These are some pictures of kids with rickets. So when I go to Nicaragua, I've seen a couple kids with rickets because um, we go to the very underdeveloped areas. So drugs for disorders involving calcium. So what do we give these patients that have issues with calcium and bone? So calcium salts, which is calcium, vitamin D, 
your calcitonin salmon, which is myocalcin, and forticalcimer. So my, myocalcin is what we see most of the time. It's very good for Paget's disease because people with Paget's disease have a lot of pain. So that myocalcin, just the way that it works, it's really good for bone pain. So hint, hint, remember this, okay? Um, bisphosphonates are your alendronate, resedronate, abandronate, on and on, zelandronate, panabronate. So those are bisphosphonates, and those actually help um, the bones, um, help rebuild the bones to decrease fracture. So we're going to go through um, some of the main ones here. Remember we talked about the SERMs, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, uh, a VISTA one in particular. Uh, so remember, they're estrogen receptor modulators. Uh, they are used for osteoporosis, which is the subject we're on now, and breast cancer. They may decrease the risk of cardiovascular events. But remember, these things can also um, <clears throat> have a side effect of um, uh, blood clotting. So you have to really watch out for blood clots, which would form in the deep vein in the calf. Most That's usually where they start. Um, so it would be very important to say, especially if they're elderly and they're taking this, to make sure they're walking a lot, uh, moving their legs around, because you certainly do not want to get a DVT. So make sure you make note of that, of what I just said. Um, some hot flashes, remember we talked about that on the, um, the first part of the course, that you can still get those vasomotor symptoms. All right, and the next one we're going to talk about is Forteo, the teriparide. It's a form of a parathyroid hormone. And so these are um, <clears throat> used for the calcium dysregulation. And um, they're supplied in 3ml injector pens. They're stored for only 28 days. So these are usually, you'll see these in cancer infusion centers. It's usually where they're given. Not to, some outpatient settings will have it usually won't see it in the hospital inpatient because this is something that they're on for maintenance more or less and um, but just so you know they come in a pen and you need to use the new pen every 28 days so if someone takes one is at home and does it and has 1.5 mls and then saves it for the next month because you use it every 28 days or every month you tell them that they need to use a new pen because we don't know if it's actually going to be um, working as well as after 28 days. So that's the rule. Get rid of whatever else you used and then use a new pen. And it's actually used by DNA. Very, It's very just one-of-a-kind type of drug. It increases the bone formation. It's generally very well tolerated, but some people can get some headaches, back pain, more like some flu-like symptoms, which is very common with some of with a lot of these newer drugs that have come out for osteoporosis. Another one, which is uh, the one of the newer ones, which is approved for osteoporosis with those with high fracture risk. It was approved in 2010. It's a subcutaneous injection. They go every six months. Usually an infusion center, cancer center will have them because it needs to be refrigerated at a certain degree, et cetera. It's called a wrinkle inhibitor, and it just has to do with the, um, they call it rink ligand, and it just interrupts a part of the um, area that would decrease bone formation and actually stops it so it can increase bone formation. This one I've never seen, and um, probably because parathyroidism is not as common and not real common, so I really haven't seen this, but it is used for primary hyperparathyroidism and secondary hyperparathyroidism caused by chronic kidney disease. Because remember, the kidneys aren't filtering, so sometimes you can have a um, <clears throat> hyperparathyroidism because the whole cycle is just not functioning. So somehow this increases sensitivity of calcium sensing receptors to act to activation by extracellular calcium. So a lot of these drugs, we don't know how they work exactly, but we do know they work, and we know a little bit about why they work, right? <laughs> that happens with a lot of medications. Um, so then what happens is your parathyroid hormone secretion is suppressed. Because remember, it's similar to the thyroid, all right? You, your um, pituitary is talking to your thyroid and if it's not producing or if it's overproducing, 
um, uh, TSH, uh, then you're probably more of a hypo. So it's the same thing with the parathyroid. So the PTH secretion suppressed because this drug is actually producing the calcium. So the PTH doesn't need to excrete as much of the hormone because it's working. So other drugs uh, for the hypercalcemia, uh, furosemide glucocorticoids, uh, gallium nitrate, bisphosphonates, inorganic, um, editate, so disodium. Um, I would say the most common ones you're going to see are the furosemide glucocorticoids and bisphosphonates. So those are the ones to pay attention to. So osteoporosis, it's the most common disorder of calcium metabolism. You get a low bone mass, you're more likely for fracture. And how do you prevent this? Well, we've discussed this before, calcium and vitamin D, right? And weight-bearing exercise is just huge. Um, after you're built, so up till about age 30, you're still building bone, give or take a couple years here, you know. Um, you're building bone. So that's why as a kid we say eat calcium, eat calcium in your diet. No supplements when you're younger um, or anything like that, but we really promote that. A healthy lifestyle because then at about 30 you're not your body's not making any more calcium so again it's really important to have calcium but once you hit menopause and the estrogen drops uh, you are basically losing bone mass calcium so that's when we start talking about supplements to help prevent that so it's primary prevention how do we diagnose it well we do a bone mineral density or DEXA scan so you'll see the DEXA scan that will detect what your FRAC score is. It's called a fracture risk score and um, they can diagnose you with osteopenia which is basically like pre-diabetes but it's pre-osteoporosis so you have to really get on board with your calcium vitamin D and your weight bearing exercise because you don't want it to, any more bone loss to go into so you have this fracture risk. So how are we going to treat osteoporosis? Well, luckily there are some drugs out there to help. Um, so some of them, Premarin, estrogen, which is estrogen, the raloxifene we talked about, which, which is the SIR medication. But then there's bisphosphonates, which have been used for years. There's studies that go back and forth whether, you know, they were taking them long term and then now we're saying they should take a vacation from it after four years, etc. So, and there's eladronate, resedronate, abadronate, so Fosamax, Actinel, and Boniva. Fosamax you take once a week, Actinel, I know Boniva is once a month. These have been out for a long time. But one thing I want you to really know about these drugs, the bisphosphonates, is that it can cause a lot of GI issues, esophagitis. Uh, so when they take these drugs, because you may be giving them in the hospital or whatever setting you're going to be in, um, that they need to sit up for at least 30 minutes after, they're ta after they take this medication because you want to really make sure this drug goes down to the stomach, starts this digestion, pro digestion process, because if you lay down, that drug can, is just going to go right up and it can wreak havoc on your esophagus. So it's very important to know that. The mycalcin spray can also help um, reduce the um, bone loss. Um, and there's two drugs that promote bone formation, and those are the Forteo and the Prolia, which is your desunamide, which is that new rink ligand, which I mentioned before. So Forteo and Prolia are two different types, of, meaning they work in two different ways, but they do both promote bone formation. Um, they are both uh, injections. Prolia you give every six months. The Forteo is the every 28 days. So treating osteoporosis in men. So there's only four drugs approved because the osteoporosis can happen in men. Um, I'll use my father for an example. He was a smoker. So people that have been lifetime smokers are at increased risk for osteoporosis and increased fracture risk. Um, those of Caucasian, um, that Mediterranean... Uh, descent um, are at more increased risk because they, um, as we say for uh, females, a white, white thin-framed female are more at risk for osteoporosis. So it's the same thing with men. 
Um, so uh, anyways, there's only four drugs approved for them. That's Defazimax, Actinel, Forteo, and Reclast. So I haven't mentioned Reclast yet. It's a once-a-year IV infusion. Um, it's, it's similar to an uh, anti-cancer medication. Um, <clears throat> Zometa is the, uh, is the other name for it, but it's once a year. It helps um, with bone rebuilding, bone remodeling, we call it. Um, you can have some flu-like symptoms after you um, get the infusion. I, I was told it's, a, I think it's a 20-minute infusion, but it's once a year. Where I work, they go to the cancer center to get it done. Doesn't mean they have cancer. It's just, you know, it's a controlled drug. It needs to be in a certain place, etc. Um, the Forteo, remember, is the every 28-day injection. Your Fosamax and Actinel is the stuff that they can take at home. Um, you can also do the Forteo at home every 28 days. Um, there's not as much research available on treatment of men because it's more common in females, but remember that there's only these four drugs, so I would really want you to know what these four drugs are. Um, so, as I mentioned before, like in Paget's disease, um, people that have severe pain with that, it's really difficult to control the pain uh, for them. So, there is a medication, the myocalcin, that's calcitonin and salmon. It's just a drug of choice for rapid pain relief with the Paget's disease. Um, other ones are not really, don't really work with it, but for some reason that myocalcin does. And um, that is it. Okay, that's it on um, calcium issues and osteoporosis.